Can you tell us your background story? Where are you from? What brought you to Australia? And what you've been up to here as a student and professionally? Okay, thank you, um, Francis, for the opportunity. Uh, first of all, I'm really grateful uh, to be given a platform to share my journey. Um, so thank you very much for that. I am originally from Pakistan. I came to Australia as an international student in 2015. Um, I did two masters. Um, the first one was in project management from Sydney Uni, and then I did an MBA majoring in professional accounting. Uh, my current role is the perfect blend of what I've studied. I think I'm very fortunate in that space because I work as a program manager in finance. So that really brings in my project management and accounting background together. So very grateful for that. And then I run very large transformational programs uh, for New South Wales Ministry of Health at the moment. Sounds like very important work. <laughs> so for those of us who live under a rock, could you tell us what New South Wales Ministry of Health does and what your role entails? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. So the New South Wales Ministry of Health is the head office for New South Wales Health. So we are the largest cluster in government. In New South Wales, we have a staff count around 150 to 160,000. It's a quite a large organization with 32 health entities, as we call them, sitting under the cluster, with the ministry being the head office. My role as a program manager is to run a very large piece of work, which is called the Cash Transformation Program, which at one point had eight concurrent projects running simultaneously. So my role is from a governance point of view to make sure all the projects are well and the dependencies are matched, looking at resources, looking at finances, looking at budgets. And I think a critical part of my role is benefits management. So the benefits that we commit to when we uh, signed off on a business case. So the cost benefit analysis to ensure that those benefits are either realized or will be realized. So I track those very closely as a part of my role. Uh, my role is also to make sure that the governance is well structured and followed through which means timely escalations of issues and risks as, equal, as required, uh, making sure our stakeholders are well informed. We do have a dedicated team of change and communications as well. So just making sure the different parts of the programs are, is well interlinked uh, and running in cohesion. It sounds like you run a lot of different programs and projects. We have dedicated project managers for each of those projects, which is not me. I am more at the program level as a program manager. So my job is really to make sure those interdependencies between the projects are well-defined. There is a uh, timely escalations if there's any issues or risks, which could, which could impact one project and then another, uh, because projects can be on a critical path. So just making sure, I guess, a program is running smoothly is really my responsibility. And then you said you work in the finance side of things, right? Yes, I oh. do. I do work. And the pro program that we're running has a huge human element to it because it's transformation. So what transformation means is bringing change to an organization, changing the way you work, changing the way you use systems, changing the way you use processes. There's a huge ele human element to what I do, which is why we have a dedicated team of change managers working on the program as well. Interesting. Could you walk me through a typical day at your job? So my program is running in a very agile fashion. Uh, for those who don't understand, agile is basically you break down your work into smaller ta tasks or chunks of tasks into a sprint. So the program runs into a two-week sprint or fortnightly sprint. Um, I dip in and out of the different project sprint meetings to make sure that if one project has an issue or a risk coming up, I need to be able to flag it to the other project managers. Um, we have specific meetings for specific purposes. So we have daily stand-ups, stand-ups are 15 minutes, but we know what everyone else is doing. We know who to go to. Uh, so it brings a lot of visibility as well. It was, it's like a short and sweet meeting in the mornings. We still have a change in communications meetings. I run quarterly risk meetings for the whole of program, which are very strategic. Every six months, I write a tranche report for the executives, which is quite detailed and it's really tracking the KPIs that we put for the program. So I do my tranche report every six months or so, give an update to the strategic board as well. And the board is a partnership between with, with three partners working together. So it's the New South Wales Health and New South Wales Treasury who provides us the funding and our banking partner. Then we have a monthly steering committee, which is also attended by our executive directors. So we've got executive directors from health, from our banking partner and treasury. So I'm pretty much locked in meetings all day. But that's what Agile is like because you've got a lot of sprint planning, sprint reviews, and they're very quick. Awesome. I wanted to ask you about your transition from, 
international student into the professional world in Australia. Uh, could you briefly walk us through your journey? And thank you for asking me this question. So I came as an international student, as I mentioned, I was doing my first master's in project management from Sydney University, which is what I always wanted to do. So I think I was always very clear of what I wanted in my professional journey and career. And then I had to do a second master's, which was an MBA in professional accounting, just for the uh, permanent residency reasons, because I applied for my PR on the basis of accounting. I got lucky in the sense that because my bachelor's was in economics I actually got <clears throat> to do the MBA in one year because I'd always study some subjects so I got some exemptions and so when I was in my last semester of my MBA I remember applying for roles online and the first question most of student companies would ask at the time was are you a permanent resident or what's your residency status and the second I would say <clears throat> I'm not a PR holder my application would drop through and that's one of the first screening questions. So you actually can't even apply. And then in my last semester, after a, very, a lot of failed attempts, I eventually tried to use LinkedIn as a tool. And I started messaging people on LinkedIn relentlessly. And out of 100 odd people that I messaged, one person replied. And I met him for coffee. And so it turned out that on my LinkedIn, there was one volunteer experience that kind of stood out for him, which was I was a social media manager for a society at Sydney Uni. And so that stood out for him because he wanted someone to help him have a social media presence for his company. And I wanted experience. So this person actually ran a company specializing in government programs, projects and portfolios. And that was perfect for me because I wanted experience in project management. So it was the perfect match. And so I started working two days a week on probation for three months until I finished my degree and that gave him a chance to understand me better and a chance to understand him better and that was it I was offered a role when I finished uni and I started working as a consultant while I was studying which I'm very fortunate to be working as a consultant and with government on a student visa which never happens and I'm very grateful for the opportunities that my first employer gave me and that's how I decided working professionally amazing how did you decide who to target when you did your LinkedIn campaign? Yeah, so look, I started looking for people who were in the project management industry. I used to go to a lot of meetups and networking events. And so this particular person actually came to the university as a guest speaker once. So I knew he was someone who was very well known in the project management industry. I very briefly spoke to him, but I remember I was very shy back then as a student uh, to come forward. But as I targeting people who were in the project management industry, I looked for people who were in senior positions or people who were owners of consulting companies because small businesses, I, I feel like they give more chance they're more open to having arrangements like my arrangement because larger organizations have a lot of red table HR rules to go through. My advice to international students or to someone who's struggling to find a job would be to actually target smaller companies. Not only uh, would you learn a lot faster because you're a small team and you're under the wings of very senior, very well-respected people, but also I feel the growth opportunity is a lot higher because they would really focus on you and it will be a very steep learning curve. I stayed for two and a half years as a consultant. I learned so much just being under his umbrella because he's a very senior person. He has years and years of experience and he was really mentoring me and really shaping and grooming me during that time. I was under his wing, teaching me so much on a daily basis, I'd say hourly basis, if anything. So that really helped me and it was, I think it helped me accelerate my career. So this first employer, did they have any concerns about hiring international students? Because I was allowed to work 20 hours a week. I was only working two days a week with him. So I was still within the limits of my um, legal requirements. And he is someone who really appreciates people because I feel like there's always something new and something different that an international student from a very different background would have to offer. So I got very lucky in that sense. I was working with someone who really valued and appreciated my point of view as well. Got it, got it. And it was through this job that you worked with NSW and then transitioned into the public sector? Yes. Yeah, so I've always been in the public sector, as I mentioned, I've worked with different departments in New South Wales, the Department of Planning, Environment, Office of Environment and Heritage. I came to health as a consultant through him. And then I was eventually offered a role in health and I stayed back. 
Could you tell us how that happened? Just one day, all of a sudden, they were like, you want to work for us? Yeah, it was really interesting. And again, very grateful. So I think I've been very fortunate to have such amazing, uplifting people in my professional journey. So I used to uh, work as a consultant at New South Wales Health. I actually got an offer from EY. <clears throat> and I went to my then boss at Health and said, till when do you need me? Because I've got an offer. I need to tell them when can I start and so on. And he said, you're not going anywhere. And I was like, what do you mean? Because there was no role for me. There was no project manager role at that time in finance. And so he actually created my role for me. So the role was created for me. I was recruited into that role. And yeah, and that was it. I stayed back and I've now been in health for five years. Got it. Got it. Okay. So you worked as a consultant for two years and then you were hired into Ministry of Health. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Got it. And you had already been working with them before you moved over to officially. Yes. Yes, I was working with them for over a year as a consultant before they offered me a job and I moved to health. Wow, they must have been really impressed with your consulting work then. I don't know about that, but no, I'm right. That's amazing. Wow. And do you know of any other international students who were able to jump into the public sector? Not the public sector, no, because public sector, you can't apply directly, as I said, in an international student visa. You have to be a permanent resident. We do get a lot of graduates who come into the public sector, but they're all residents in Australia. And I have helped a lot of international students get jobs in Australia, though, but they're more in the private sector because the private sector is a lot more lenient with the visa requirements. Can you walk us through your visa status and then how that's changed over time? Yeah, definitely. So I came as an international student. That was my student visa. And I had to study for two and a half years because the requirement to get a temporary work visa in Australia is two years of postgraduate. So my first degree was a year and a half, the project management one, which is why I had to do a second one to cover up. And the second one was for one year. So it took me two and a half years uh, to do two masters. And by the time I finished, I was actually overqualified for the market because I was overstudied with no experience. And then I transitioned to my work visa, which was for two years. This is when I was a consultant. And then I, simultaneously, I was applying for my permanent residency. So I gave... PDE, which is an English uh, test. I gave Nati, which made me a certified translator. So, you know, all the different things you do just to get some extra points because accounting is one of the hardest skills to get a permanent residency on. PR in Australia works on the basis of supply and demand. So there are always a lot more accountants in terms of supply and a lot less jobs in terms of demand. So the points are quite high for accountants. So I had to keep on doing different things to accumulate more points. Anyway, eventually <clears throat> applied for my permanent residency in 2019 when I had enough points. <clears throat> and then I got very lucky in January 2020s when I got my permanent residency two months before COVID happened. I was very fortunate because had I not gotten it then, I would have been stuck. I probably would have had to leave Australia, if anything, because I would have been on a temporary visa, which was expiring. And immigration was pretty much on hold during the COVID times. So I got very lucky. So I got my permanent residency in Jan 2020. And then in, I think, June 21, I applied. For, I was given an invitation to apply for citizenship. So I gave my citizenship test and I eventually got my passport around October 21. Nice. Congrats. Thank you. It was a six and a half year long journey. What do you feel has been the trickiest part of dealing with uh, visas in Australia? Uh, so many. So policies keep changing is one. You feel like there's a bar and you try to reach that bar and the bar goes up and you try to reach that. <laughs> Because the requirements keep changing or it's either keep adding more. I think the trickiest part also is this English test, which <clears throat> to be honest, I passed, but I don't quite understand the need for it given my country, for instance, Pakistan is a Commonwealth country and we speak English from since we are five. All our officials are in English. But you still have to give this test, still have to reach a really high bandwidth to qualify for getting five additional points, which I think is very tricky wow. because 
you have to work hard on a language that it's quite native to us. I found that very tricky. I found Nati, which was a translator exam, very tricky as well because it's a 10 minute test and you pay $800 or something, which is ridiculous. You wait six months to get your slot because so many people apply for it and it's quite popular to get five more points. And because you're doing a translation test, you have to switch between English to Urdu, Urdu to English. And in our country, we don't speak proper Urdu. We speak the mix of English and Urdu. And the Urdu that you have to speak in the translation exam is the official Urdu, which we never speak. So I had to learn my own language in Australia, which I hadn't ever spoken. So that was very tricky. Uh, but thankfully, I passed in the first go, uh, because otherwise I would have to wait another six months or, or so and pay the huge amounts to redo it. So I, I feel like the whole immigration system, unfortunately, is very hard. And because there's so many people applying, if you miss one boat, then you have to wait a long time for the next one while your visa is, is expiring. It sounds like a very convoluted process. Are there any resources you would recommend to other international students going through it right now? Yeah, look, I think post-COVID, a lot has changed. A lot of policies have changed. I would say YouTube is really good because a lot of immigration consultants put up a lot of videos on what's changing. And as I said, Australian immigration is based on skills. So it depends on your skills, right? whether you're an engineer, a doctor, accountant, um, teacher. Have a look at that. There's specific YouTube videos or by immigration consultants that would really help you. Can I ask if you experienced any culture shock in your time in Australia, whether personally or professionally? Yeah, I think I did face a few. In Pakistan, you call everyone Sarah or Madam. In Australia, you call everyone by their name. And in our culture, in Pakistan, that's very disrespectful to call everyone by their name. So I used to feel a bit funny about it when I had to start working because I'm supposed to call them Sir or Ma'am or whatever. Whereas in Australia, it's really frowned upon because everyone is so humble here. <laughs> they get taken aback to and go like, you don't have to call me that. So that was definitely my first culture shock. My second one was probably around how chill everyone is at work in terms of dressing up because for me, I always thought that I need to have a professional attire, like pencil skirts or pants and heels and all that. And it was really interesting because I would hardly see anyone <clears throat> wearing that in government. So yeah, there were a few culture shocks for sure. But I think I've probably absorbed that now. So I think now if someone calls me ma'am, I find it very strange. And just go, please don't call me ma'am. Like this feels weird. And can you talk maybe a little bit about differences in work culture between Pakistan and uh, Australia? Yeah, one of the first big difference was uh, you have to, in Pakistan, put up your photo and your resume. In Australia, you shouldn't put your photo in a resume. When I was recruited, asked me to take my photo off. I was like, really? And he, they were like, yeah, take it off. We don't need a photo here. Work culture in Pakistan is very different. It's a lot more red tape <clears throat> that you have to overcome. Not to say that it's not there in Australia, definitely there as well. But I think there's a lot more appreciation of talent here. There's a lot more appreciation of the the differences from different cultural backgrounds. Australia is such a wide mix of different cultures coming together. It's a melting pot. I think there's a lot more appreciation of that and flexibility around that. And I do find, at least in my time here, I've been given a lot of opportunities. Uh, I think me being a young female, non-white, I was ticking a lot of boxes from a diversity and inclusion perspective. And that gave me a lot of opportunity that probably I won't have gotten in Pakistan. So I'm very grateful for that. Definitely very different working styles here um, than in Pakistan. In Pakistan, it's a lot more formal. Here, it is formal, but you also feel like your boss is more approachable. And you mentioned you had worked with a recruiter. Could you tell us about that experience? Yeah, I've worked with several recruiters. I would say my experience was okay. Some were great. One recruiter once told me to change my name because it was so hard for companies to remember me. I was taken aback by that because I said, look, it's a multicultural com country and you don't have to say my name correctly. You don't have to. I would not get offended. I understand my name is quite a difficult name. But having said that, I will not change my identity. I, but then, to be fair, there were some who were super helpful as well. Uh, my visa was always a problem at the time because I was a student visa. So I think while recruiters are great and they do try to help you to the best of their ability, sometimes you have to make your own luck.
Were these recruiters that reached out to you on LinkedIn? I reached out to some, reached out to me. I've tried to keep my LinkedIn profile up to date as much as I can. So I do get approached by recruiters a lot even now. But having said that at the time when I was actively looking, I would reach out to them and a lot of them would call me. I try to understand what I want, what's my background and try to match me with a potential job opportunity. And is this something you would recommend to current international students looking for a job? 100% reach out to recruiters and even if you don't get anything out of it it's a great learning experience because you will learn how to talk to recruiters how to explain what you want and eventually if you talk to say a company director like I did you'll be a lot more clear on what you really want out of a role. How would you suggest uh, a current international student find a recruiter? Uh, LinkedIn search by people search by city filter down to the industry linkedin has a lot of keywords that you can use to in your search bar and it will really help you filter down to the right person use google google up the top recruitment agencies in say sydney if you're very specific to which city you want and would you say that recruitment agencies generally work with international students? They do. I think there's definitely an awareness now on the value international students bring and look even if they can't find your job, it, like I said, will be a great learning experience regardless. Knock on all doors, recruitment agencies, companies on LinkedIn, go to that company's page and see who works there and then target those people, message them. Knock on all doors, eventually one will open. Last question about recruiters. So they do work with grads. It's not just experienced professionals. Yes, definitely. That's cool. <laughs> Oh, I'd love to learn more about your job, actually. Let's start with favorite and least favorite parts of your work right now. Mm, my favorite part of my work is my team. I have an amazing team and I'm very grateful uh, to be working with such experienced, knowledgeable and friendly co-workers. Uh, I feel like a family. We don't just talk about work. We talk about what everyone's doing in their personal lives and so on. I know my colleagues' babies' names, for instance, or little things like that, and they know what I'm doing on the weekend. So that's probably the best part. What is the worst part of my job at the moment? I actually won't call it the worst part, but I'm trying to figure out my career progression. I would like to stay in the Ministry of Health. However, where I am in finance, we don't really have um, a portfolio. So I've already done program management. The next step for me would be portfolio management, which is one level up, but we don't have a portfolio office. So that is probably a bit of a roadblock. But having said that, there could be other opportunities I can knock on because health is a huge organization. So I wouldn't call it the worst thing. It's just a challenge that I need to overcome. So you start at project manager and then you go up to program management and then portfolio management is that how this works in this field project coordinator which is more a grad role the coordinator then jumps into like a senior coordinator project coordinator and then you jump into a project manager senior project manager it depends on the hierarchy of the organization um, and then from there you jump into a program manager and from a program manager you jump into a portfolio manager so projects and programs are temporary organizations. So there's start date, end date, clear outcome. You start a project or a program with a clear objective that you want to achieve by this much time. So for instance, let's start with the project, which is the base. So the project out for six months, one year, you achieve, you finish. Program would have multiple projects popping up, finishing, and then another project would pop up. So program is a more strategic and a level up from projects. For instance, to give you an example, the program that I'm running is a three-year program with 10 projects, but all 10 of them didn't run at the same time. We had two start off and finish and three more started off while the first two were running and so on. So we break down our program into tranches of work, right? A tranche is a set of uh, similar projects. So that's program management. And then the portfolio would have different programs and different projects running within a portfolio of work, for instance, finance, for a simplistic reason, let's say finance is a portfolio for a small organization. So within finance, you will have, um, say, administration. Then you'll have accounts receivable, accounts payable. So each of those th three could become a program. Then you will have multiple projects within the AR space, multiple projects in the admin space, multiple projects in the AP space. So that's how you structure it. So a portfolio is really the breadth of it. And a portfolio is not temporary because the finance has to be there as a part of the organization to run. So as long as the organization is there, finance has to be there. So it's permanent. That makes sense. So portfolio is the permanent structure.
and so on your so since you're a program manager are the people on your team project coordinators? Yep, we have got, got quite a few. We've got project managers, we've got scrum masters because our program's agile, we've got business subject matter experts, we've got technical subject matter experts, we've got change experts, change managers, communications experts. So we've got quite a few people. The program has around 60, 65 resources at a time working on the program. And does each of these roles correspond to different levels in the bureaucracy? Grades, yes. We have what is called the Crown Clerk Grade in the Ministry of Health, Treasury and Education. Got it. And does your salary correspond to the grade? Does everyone at the same grade make the same salary? In government, that's how it is. There are no bonuses. (laughs) (laughs) And how long does it usually take to get promoted to the next grade yeah look it's obviously based on performance so within a grade there are four tiers so each year you have a performance review and if you're doing fine you can get a bump up to the next grade so for instance to give an example of my grade it's called 11 12 crown clerk grade it's the highest non-executive grade in government so you start off with 11 minimum 11 max 12 minimum 12 max so every year based on your performance you get the next level up so i am now 12 max so i've reached the height of my uh, band at the moment but it is based on your performance obviously so if there are performance issues then you don't get bumped up and uh, performance reviews are quite rigorous in health. Um, we really have to fill out documents about what we've done, go through those with our direct manager and if needed, um, the next level up as well. Are there any misconceptions about public sector work that you found to be totally false yes. since you started? Yes. Yes. So there is this huge misconception which fails me is that life is a lot easy at public <laughs> sector. You finish up at 4 p.m. apparently or some pe- someone said to me 3, 3.30 and I just stared at them because I don't know who are these people who finish up so early. I don't know anyone personally, and I've been in health for quite some time. Definitely a huge misconception on the amount of work. People think there's not that much work in government. It's pretty slow. It's not as fast-paced as a private sector. That is not true. COVID years aside, there's always been a lot happening in public sector and in the future years, there are a lot more projects and programs coming through. So I think that's a huge misconception that in government, there's not a lot of work. That is not true at all. Could you talk about your workload, your work-life balance, your hours? I won't say I have said hours. I do think that my direct line manager is very flexible. She doesn't micromanage us. As long as we do our work, she's happy. Typically, like my meetings would finish around six at most. And if I want to do my own stuff, say go to gym or go out with friends or whatever I would do that wrap up close off and then if I need to I jump back and work at night so I think it's more a matter of me doing my own work as required meeting my deadlines as opposed to you have to work from nine to six or something Um, it's not like there's a lot of flexibility if I need to go to say the doctors in the middle of work or whatever post office just tell your direct manager your colleagues or whatever and everyone's pretty okay with it because everyone understands when you have a life outside of work as well so it's quite flexible in that sense which I really appreciate but obviously that doesn't mean that I don't jump into my meetings as required or I'm just not available (laughs) because I do something personal and everyone understands that but having said that you obviously are responsible for your job how much leave you get in the health ministry yeah look in government typically we get around four weeks of annual leave we get sick leave as well which i think is around two to three weeks annually i'm sorry don't quote me on the sick leave thankfully i don't need to take it mm-hmm. um and then they've given a lot of special leave for special, for example, bereavement leave if someone passes away. There's mental health leave now, which it comes under sick leave, by the way. So if you go to a doctor and you get a mental health plan made, and they qualify you as someone who needs mental health leave, then you can take that as well under sick leave, which is very, very really good. And I really appreciate that because mental health is something that didn't get as much importance previously as it is getting now. You can apply for a therapist. I think they give you 10 sessions annually. You can get like dietitians to so get a lot of resources. On a scale of one to 10, how stressful would you say your job is? My job can be very stressful because my job requires managing stakeholders I don't manage systems I manage people so it can 
be stressful at times. I would say it can go up to nine at times. What would you say is the most stressful part of managing people instead of systems? Ex expectations. Definitely for your senior stakeholders, because you are given a certain budget, a very strict timeline when you do a business case. Projects are small, as I said, six months, one year, max two years. Programs are a lot longer. You can only predict what it's going to be like in three years or four years time, right? So you're managing expectations quite hard. But I think the best way to do that is to keep them on the journey, you know, just keep them <clears throat> informed of any issues that can impact your cost, your schedule, your resourcing, for instance. Yeah, as long as you communicate openly and effectively, I think that's the best thing that you can do. Got it. And... I know you said they created this role for you. Are there similar roles across government or is this a really unique case? No, they are. It just didn't exist in the ministry, but I think now they've started to create a lot of project manager roles. This was back in the day when I came to health in 2018. No, there are a lot of project management jobs in government. As I said, there are a lot of projects coming in government. There are a lot in the pipeline at the moment. A lot of programs, projects are going to come forward and are in the market. So there are definitely a lot of jobs out there. What's your best advice for a grad who wants to get into project management in government? Don't be afraid. <laughs> I think that the thing with grads is they really doubt themselves. They feel they don't have experience or they don't have that much to offer, which is not true at all. I've worked with grads. I get grads every six months and they are exceptionally bright. They are really talented. We value them. So value yourself is my advice. Wow. It's one thing to tell people, have confidence in yourself, but it's another thing to hear it directly from someone like you who manages them, that they actually yeah. are doing good. Oh, no, they, are, they are exceptionally bright, I would say. I love getting grads in our team because they just bring so much new in perspective, insights, and they're hardworking, um, very talented, and they implement new ways of working. Could you talk briefly about the most exciting project you've worked on? Okay, so I won't call it the most exciting. It was actually very stressful, but it was definitely the most interesting, uh, which is this project, which was called Rights of Private Practice, uh, which is around the the automation of a form that doctors use, our staff specialists in particular use. It was very technical, but it was really interesting because you're dealing with staff specialists, you're dealing with finance, and you're dealing with HR. So it's, it was a wide area of stakeholders and then the executives were involved. It is a very political landscape, as you can imagine, because pays it's, and salaries is always a political space to work with. A lot of unions are involved in everything. I learned a lot in that project. I learned at the different levels of work, how the HR systems work within health, how the finance, and it comes from doctor to head of finance, that whole stream of work. So yeah, that was definitely a very interesting project for me to work on. And I'm very grateful I got to do it. What would you say is like the biggest takeaway from that experience? Managing difficult stakeholders. <laughs> I had to uh, work with the doctors' union. Obviously, there's a lot of like legalities around these things and stuff. So it was really interesting. Um, and I learned a lot from them. Working with them, I got exposed to the legal side of it and the things that you have to consider in a project like that. So steep learning curve.